Hi everyone. I'd like to begin this video by thanking a viewer, Timothy H., for suggesting the topic of addiction. So props to you, Timothy H., for that. Anyhow, probably the first thing to say about addiction is that there are two basic ways of defining it. First, there's the clinical definition, which in the United States is contained in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM-5. This clinical definition includes 10 classes of substance-related disorders plus one so-called non-substance-related disorder, which is gambling addiction. But beyond this definition, there's the much broader, more conventional way that people understand addiction, which includes not only the types of addiction mentioned in the DSM, but many additional phenomena. Things like sex addiction, video game addiction, shopping addiction, pornography addiction, and so on. In this video, I'd like to focus on the more conventional way of seeing addiction rather than on its more strict clinical definition. That's because I'd like this video to be accessible and relevant to the general public and not merely to clinical specialists. Plus, I'd like to explore addiction as a widespread cultural phenomenon and not just as a clinical problem. Okay, so let's get started. In my view, one of the most amazing things about the culture of the United States, where I live, is the extent to which our lives are governed by the dynamics of addiction. In fact, to me, it's practically impossible to understand our culture without also understanding that we're a nation of addicts. But what do I mean by this? Well, probably the most obvious indicator of our culture's addictive nature has to do with our perennial problems with drugs, both legal and illegal. For instance, Tobacco has, for many years, been identified as the number one source of preventable death in the United States, but alcohol isn't too far behind in the rankings. In this regard, the drugs that are acceptable parts of our everyday culture account for more than half a million preventable deaths every single year, which is many times more than all of the illegal drugs, plus all of the homicides, plus all of our traffic deaths combined. But if that's not enough, consider the fact that the DSM estimates that 85% of our children regularly consume caffeine, a drug mentioned among its 10 classes of substance-related disorders, and people hardly ever question it. But our cultural problems with addictive substances are really only the tip of the iceberg. A lot of our everyday behavior also has an addictive element. For instance, how many of us would be seriously jonesing if we had to give up our cell phones and internet access for a few weeks? I'm guessing that at this point it would be more than 90% of the population. But beyond technology, even our more general relation to commodity culture seems pretty addictive a lot of the time. In my view, the great 21st century sage Tyler Durden crystallizes this phenomenon best. In Fight Club he says, Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so that we can buy shit we don't need. How are we to understand this kind of bizarre self-defeating behavior if not by way of the dynamics of addiction? Basically, addiction, both literal and figurative, is all around us and I would say constitutes a major part of our culture structure. So what's going on here? Well, as with any social phenomenon, the underlying etiology is probably complex. However, I would say that a large fraction of it has to do with the fact that a lot of us are living really empty, psychologically barren lives. Lives marked mostly by a pervasive sense of psychological and spiritual poverty. The fact is that when we're in the opposite state, when we're living in a condition of psychological abundance, there's really very little need to resort to some sort of addictive strategy just to get through the day. When we feel basically good and fulfilled as human beings, our inner resources are more than enough to allow us to meet life's difficult challenges without any external crutch. But a lot of the time, we don't feel like that. A lot of the time, the main thing that's going on for us is the dull, unremitting daily grind. Week after week, year after year. And so, after a while, it makes a perverse kind of sense for us to grasp desperately at anything that would seem to offer a few minutes of relief from that. 
God, just give us anything, anything, entertain us, intoxicate us. Let us feel that warm thrill of ownership when we buy something new. Maybe a new iPhone, maybe a new laptop, maybe a new pair of shoes. Oh, new shoes. I like your status. More addiction. Yeah, just give us that next fix. Just one more hit. And this time, Let's make it a big one. Well, that's American culture. Well, not all of American culture, but definitely a pretty significant part of it. And by the way, similar addictive dynamics run through a lot of our international relationships too. Like how we're all shocked and dumbfounded when the big oil producing dealers, I mean uh, nations, put the squeeze on us for the umpteenth time, reminding us that we're pretty much addicted to that too. And on the other side of the addictive coin, there's our so-called financial aid to foreign nations. <laughs> so, do you really think that we're doing all that just because we're such incredible, generous altruists? Well, personally, I don't think so. From what I can see, it's basically about getting other countries addicted to our money so that we can easily manipulate them, especially so that they'll eventually start turning tricks for us when the time comes. It's the same basic strategy behind pretty much every 2-bit drug dealer and pimp, just expanded to an international scale. So yeah, I'd say that a lot of our lives, both individually and collectively, are really about addiction in various forms and guises. And at this point in the video, all of that probably seems pretty bleak. That's because when we're in the actual throes of addiction, either literal or figurative, it is pretty bleak. All that's going on at that point is the circular trap of trying to avoid pain in the short term by generating even more pain in the long term, both for ourselves and for whoever is unlucky enough to have to deal with us. And at the same time, generating mountains of denial and self-deception to cover it up, which is pretty much the chapter and verse of addiction. And by the way, if you ever find yourself saying something like, well, I don't have a problem because I can quit any time I want. I just don't want to right now. Watch out, because that's pretty much the very first sentence in every Addictions 101 handbook. However, despite all of that suffering and self-deception, I would say that there is a positive side to addiction, but it's found mostly in the process of living beyond it rather than in the addictive experience per se. Part of that has to do with the fact that getting through an addiction usually requires some kind of bottoming out experience. In other words, experiencing an ordeal of such unbearable horror and torment that it causes us, if we're lucky enough to survive it, and I mean that quite literally, it causes us to reorient ourselves toward life in a fundamental way, all the way down to the most basic levels of our existence. Bottoming out is about reaching the point where our cozy little habits and customary ways of perceiving things are no longer working and will no longer sustain us. It's about the end of our comfort zone and the end of our world, at least as we've known it thus far. In other words, every addiction is a possible gateway for us to pass through if we can summon the honesty and courage to do so. Every addiction is a possible opportunity to experience real growth and self-transcendence. That's because getting through an addiction and learning from the terror and degradation of bottoming out demands that we change our lives and develop far greater self-knowledge and self-honesty and wisdom than we've ever known before. It means letting go of the whole cheap litany of denial and deception that almost always accompanies addictive behavior and that almost always pervades the larger run of life too. It means experiencing a genuine metamorphosis at the deepest levels of our being. So the chance to develop more self-knowledge, honesty, and wisdom, along with the chance to grow substantially as a human being, seem like substantial benefits. But what other possible positive benefits are there? Some years ago, I posed that question to an elderly gentleman who had many years of sobriety under his belt. He said, when you've left your addictions behind, that's when your decisions become real. Let's just repeat that. When you've left your addictions behind, that's when your decisions become real. In other words, while we're still in the thrall of our addictive habits, our decisions are like phantoms, without real form and without real power. 
They're really just clever ways of fooling ourselves, like a kind of theater, a pantomime of excuses we perform for ourselves and anyone else will pay attention. In other words, our supposed decisions are in reality little more than a symptom of our spiritual enslavement, and our freedom is a complete illusion too, because our addictive habits are what's determining everything for us. So the question underneath all of our addictions is always, how free are we willing to be, and what are we willing to give up to realize it? However, at the same time, realizing our freedom is never merely for our own sake. Our personal liberation, or lack thereof, is always affecting our relationships with the people around us. So another benefit is that when we start to liberate ourselves, that's when our relationships become genuine and substantive. And the more we lay claim to our own freedom, the more we can serve as a living invitation for other people to lay claim to theirs. But the hard reality is that despite these sorts of benefits, most of us feel a fair amount of ambivalence about the possibility of liberating ourselves from our addictions. Part of us would of course love to do that, but the fact is that most of us have grown pretty comfortable, perhaps too comfortable, with our already existing habits and constrictions. And so, we're not easily brought to the outer edges of our world, to that difficult horizon where we can really pass beyond ourselves. As Joseph Campbell once noted in his account of the monomyth, we rarely enter into our hero's journey easily or willingly. For the most part, life has to drag us kicking and screaming into our deeper destinies, and addiction can be one of life's ways of doing that. But difficult ordeals like that are almost always necessary to the larger process because it takes a raging holocaust, an endless desert of flame and smoke, to burn away what is cheap and impure in us, to temper our inner steel, as it were. And so, in a way, the most difficult part of the larger process of addiction is not surviving the inferno of a bottoming out experience, which is already difficult enough. The most difficult part of the process has to do with really wanting to change. Not just telling ourselves and everyone else that we want to change, because words like that can be very, very cheap, but really wanting it to happen. So much so that we're willing to step forward into any transformative firestorm to make it possible. Because as Viktor Frankl once observed, that which would shine must learn to endure burning. And in turn, I find that coming into that kind of desperate resolve, the kind that's willing to endure burning, has mostly to do with allowing ourselves to become completely and utterly exhausted with the moronic tedium of our addictive habits, along with our endless litany of failures and excuses, finally and definitively saturated with all of our enslavement to our petty desires and petty selves, which only sabotages and subverts the power of our deeper destinies in life. Enervate and drained to the core by all of our evasions and deceptions, and most of all, by the utter smallness of our lives and habits. And perhaps at that point of complete depletion and desolation, if we're lucky enough, a kind of defiant voice can begin to whisper deep inside us, a voice fiercely insisting that the only way of life that's truly worthy of our souls is the deepest, freest, most untrammeled pattern of human existence imaginable, a voice resolute and unwavering, proclaiming again and again that we will not settle and we will not be enslaved, not ever again, not by all of the combined seductive clamor of our petty desires and habits, by nothing and by no one in this world, we will be free, whatever the cost. And as that voice begins to resound ever more loudly and clearly in our lives, we can perhaps discover that that voice has really been our own all along, and that it's taken the long and painful road of addiction to finally pay attention to it. Have a good day.